All right. Wow. I like the hair. You're growing I, it up. Well, hello. Can I, can I still hear you? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, actually, I don't have a choice in the matter. All the bar barber shops are shut down. So, yeah, I'm growing it out. <laughs> I'm keeping mine smooth. I've got the razor, so. Yeah, yeah. I know. You're a monk. Um, <laughs> Well, this is uh, the first official Avram Davidson podcast, and I could not think of a better guest than you, his son, uh, to, be, uh, to be our first guest star, and the Avram Davidson podcast is to basically discuss all things Avram Davidson, the Avram, oh, Davidson, no. the Avram Davidson universe, so to speak. All right. Well, fire away. All right. So... No, no set agenda today. Just okay. kind of talk away. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll start off with kind of a big question, which was starting off, you know, Auburn was your dad. What, what was it like having Auburn as your dad? What was that like growing up with him? Uh, that's a pretty, that would take a while to, I mean, people have asked me that and I'm like, well, I don't I have no basis of comparison. I did have a second dad, that's true, but um, I mean, he moved all the time. Yeah. Every few months he moved. He tried to stay close to me when I was little, younger, so I could spend the weekend. So we moved all around the Bay Area, East Bay, Marin, San Francisco. And then uh, when I became a teenager, you know, it became a little harder because uh, um, you know, you want to be in the same place on the weekends as you are during the week and stuff. And, um, I, and then he started moving really far. But um, I mean, that's not the only thing. That's a very, very broad question. Yeah. You got to narrow it down a little. Well, talk about some of the places that you moved and I mean, maybe start there. All right. Well, he lived in, yeah, that, that's also huge. He lived in Novato. Uh, I remember, yeah, and we would feed horses, carrots, and then um, we got these two little dogs and their mom, and it got they got into the neighbor's chicken coops and did it. Was that, was that Mudge it? That was Mudge. No, that was Mudge. Well, we ended up with Mudge. I know. So okay. let me tell the story. Anyway, <laughs> he massacred all these chickens, so we got rid of the, of the, of the mom and just kept Herman and Mudge, the two brothers, and eventually Avram took uh, Herman and and um, and we got Mudge. So that's that story. Um, he lived on the houseboats in Sausalito, which was a crazy scene. Um, he lived in uh, San Francisco. He lived in Oakland, in Berkeley, in uh, some crazy hippie heat scene in uh, Lagunitas, and oh. Uh, a very wild hippie scene in Mill Valley in a place, in a house with a million people in it, which he called the Flea Circus. <laughs> uh, he was kind of, uh, you know, sort of the father figure there, like at the house meetings and stuff, people would say something weird or stupid and he'd bring it back to earth a little bit. You know, they'd be arguing about who got the sleeping platform in the backyard and what they were using it for and stuff. And then uh, he lived in, you know, San Francisco and Clement Street and on and on and on, really. Okay. And, and in, terms, in terms of maybe, you know, I think about Lime Killer, for example, in terms of impacting his writing. Oh, yeah, that was based on Bailey's, obviously. Yeah. He lived there. Uh, and I, Grania lived there, sep they'd already been separated, but they lived there. I, I lived there as a really small child, about four, uh, but I remember a lot of it, and I went back and forth between her pl his place in Belize City, where they had this big porch, and they had this caged-in quash, which is kind of like a long raccoon with a long nose, and then Grania, who was living in um, Gales Point, which was this really remote village that you had to like go on Wait. a hired boat through Wait, this hold on. maze of mangroves. Wait, Wait. so a so little, little bit confused here. Yeah. Um, I know they lived in Mexico at one point. That was when they were still together. Okay. And then I know they all, so did they come back and then go back out there separately? I believe, yeah. Well, first, um, 
<laughs> I mean, I think Avram first just kept going south and discovered Belize. I think I came back to uh, the U.S. I don't know. There was so much coming and going, and I was okay. so young. I, I really can't keep track of it all. All right. Uh, in in terms of in terms of mom and Avram, what I mean, you know, they they had such a unique relationship. They obviously yeah. continued to collaborate on their writing, right? Uh, but they divorced yet. He was my godfather, and I mean, right. so they I'm divorced um, when I was about three. So I have no memory of them as a couple. Okay. Um, and apparently, they were like, "Okay, we're not in romantic love at all, but we're still good friends. It helps. We have joint custody of a kid, and all that." And then, yeah, they stayed friends. Of course, they fought like cats and dogs sometimes, and um, <laughs> they wrote some stuff together that I think is some of both of their their writing best because she could do like plots and stuff and he could do all the you know details that that were his specialty yeah no i i agree i mean i agree some of some, i think uh she made like it Marco Polo was was a good book oh yeah i mean i think i think obviously you know and, and i think the next question which was clearly his brilliance was incredible Right. I keep describing him as Wikipedia before there was Wikipedia. I mean, how? Well, they, 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 people that came told me I have an encyclopedia. Everything I say is encyclopedic. That was before Wikipedia. Now, okay. now it's Wikipedic. But um, yeah, so here's a couple of theories I have on how he got to be smart. Now, uh, so smart. How? And basically, there's, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, he was 40 when I was born. So, but from what he told me, uh, genetics played a role. Okay, not his father, who was a boxer, who he said probably never read a whole book in his life. But then if you go back one or two more generations on that lineage uh, to Europe, there was a guy who apparently he was called the Iron Box because he was really short and he had the entire... Uh, Talmud and Torah. So the Torah is the Old Testament, and the Talmud is this commentary on it that's huge. And supposedly he had all of it memorized. Um, so yeah, now I think that he, like Grania and like me, may have been a bit on the autistic spectrum. Because autistic people tend to specialize, really specialize, and have great talent in certain areas and then not be very talented at all in a lot of other areas. And that was, that was certainly true of him and Grania and me. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Interesting. Um, you know, actually taking a step back, his dad was a boxer, which I find Correct. really interesting. And then I've heard, I've heard some conflicting stories. Was Avram a medic or an infantryman in World War II? Because I've heard two different accounts of that. Okay, I'll tell you exactly what he was. He was what's called, well, they have, and they still do this. So there are people who are technically in the Marines, okay. but they are stationed with the Navy as medics. I forget the exact terms, uh, but anyway, that's okay. a thing that the military does for whatever reason, and that's what he was. Okay. He was so a, he never, he never, never carried a gun. gun. No, he never carried a gun. I mean, probably okay. during basic training he did, but uh, right. um, he never was armed. He was not actually a soldier. He was a medic. Okay. And same thing in the Israeli yeah, war? Yeah, he was a medic with the Israeli Navy. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. And, and, and in terms of, I mean, obviously brilliant writer, um, you know, his dad was a boxer. Was, was he, you know, thinking about athletics, was he an athlete at all? Huh. No. <laughs> so he couldn't swim or ride a bike. Um, he told me once that he had never enjoyed playing or watching a game of any kind in his entire life. Interesting. Did you ever meet, did you ever meet his dad? very briefly when I was like 11 in New Jersey where he was living and I was basically too excited to be have a swimming pool to uh, uh to give much attention to him the swimming pool was you know I'd been all we'd been on a long bus trip so, so, so wait yeah. the, 
So the the dad, Auburn's dad, had a swimming pool. Well, he lived in a hotel. Of oh, some okay. Sort. Yeah. So I mean, did Auburn? I get the impression, and I could be wrong, but I get the impression that he did not come from a lot of money. No, uh, I don't terms, think so either. So in in terms of, I mean, you know, going back to kind of coming from a poor family. I mean, brilliant writer, probably not recognized the way he should have been. Yeah. Ended up, unfortunately, ended up also dying penniless. Uh, for the most part, any thoughts on that? I mean, what 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 got him there as this incredible writer that again probably should have been recognized, hanging out with Philip K. Dick, other great authors, and yet didn't get much recognition. Any thoughts on that? Yes, lots of them. Okay, uh, he started out writing for Jewish periodicals when he was super Jewish and very Zionist before he actually lived in Israel. So um, he started out doing that. And then, I don't exactly know how, but he got into writing science fiction, uh, you know, back in the pulp days when they paid a nickel a word and that kind of stuff, uh, books, as well as short stories. And um, why didn't he get really recognized? I think because his stuff is just too brainy. It yeah. really requires reading, concentrating. It's not like take to the beach and... Uh, you know, relax on a, on a day off, you know? It takes, uh, you have to really engage with it. And some of it, you kind of have to know the historical background to really get it. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I know, I mean, we've talked about this. Growing up, you know, you could pick up, I mean, I loved Orson Scott Card and, you know, Robert Silverberg, incredible authors, yeah. but, also, but also readable. Like you said, you can go out to the beach and enjoy it. Right. Uh, and when we both, I know, as as youth tried to read some of his stories, it was just what it was tough. I read some of them, but I had the advantage of having him right there. So I could say, what does this mean? What does this <laughs> ending mean? Right. You know, when I was 13 or so. And he'd explain it. Every once in a while, I inspired one, I think. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, he took bits of dialogue from everybody, including you. Uh, he, things that people said would end up in, in his books as dialogue and stuff. What about, you know, any favorite story of yours? If you had to go back and, and talk about one of Auburn's stories that just you really enjoy that was your favorite, what would it be? Huh. Well, I think with all the seeds with oysters had an influence on me that I wasn't really aware until I reread it when we started doing this, because I was obsessed for a long time with the topic of insects that um, camouflage as humans. And I, I even wrote a play about it and got it produced. I thought that the source was an old underground comic called Insect Fear and my general obsession with insects. But now that I read um, All the Seas with Oysters, I realized that it was about creatures that camouflage, not as people, but as household objects. And I'm like, wow, this must have gotten into my mind somehow without me even realizing it. <laughs> so, well, I mean, I think this, that's a great segue into listening to the story and then uh, going ahead and discussing the story afterwards. Okay. So, yeah, let me, uh, let me get it set up. Or all the seas with oysters. When the man came into the F&O bike shop, Oscar greeted him with a hearty, Hi there! Then, as he looked closer at the middle-aged visitor with the eyeglasses and business suit, his forehead creased, and he began to snap his thick fingers. Oh, say, I know you, he muttered. Mr. Um, name's on the tip of my tongue, doggone it. Oscar was a barrel-chested fellow. He had orange hair. Why, sure you do, the man said. There was a lion's emblem in his lapel. Remember, you sold me a girl's bicycle with gears for my daughter. Uh, we got to talking about that uh, red French racing bike your partner was working on. Oscar slapped his big hand down on the cash register. He raised his head and rolled his eyes up. Mr. Watney! Mr. Watney beamed. Oh, sure! Gee, how could I forget? And we went across the street afterward and had a couple of beers. Well, how you been, Mr. Watney? 
I guess the bike, um, it was an English model, wasn't it? Yeah. It must have given satisfaction or you would have been back, huh? Mr. Watney said the bicycle was fine, just fine. Then he said, I understand there's been a change, though. You're all by yourself now. Your partner, Oscar looked down, pushed his lower lip out, nodded. You heard, huh? Yep. I'm all by myself now. Over three months now. The partnership had come to an end three months ago, but it had been faltering long before then. Ferd liked books, long-playing records, and high-level conversation. Oscar liked beer, bowling, and women. Any women, any time. The shop was located near the park. It did a big trade in renting bicycles to picnickers. If a woman was barely old enough to be called a woman, and not quite old enough to be called an old woman, or if she was anywhere in between, and if she was alone, Oscar would ask, How does that machine feel to you? All right? Why, I guess so. Taking another bicycle, Oscar would say, Well, I'll just ride along a little bit with you to make sure. Be right back, Ferd. Ferd always nodded gloomily. He knew that Oscar would not be right back. Later, Oscar would say, Hope you made out in the shop as good as I did in the park. Leaving me all alone here all that time, Ferd grumbled. And Oscar usually flared up. Okay, then, next time you go and leave me stay here. See if I begrudge you a little fun. But he knew, of course, that Ferd, tall, thin, pop-eyed Ferd, would never go. Do you good, Oscar said, slapping his sternum. Put hair on your chest. Ferd muttered that he had all the hair on his chest that he needed. He would glance down covertly at his lower arms. They were thick with long black hair, though his upper arms were slick and white. It was already like that when he was in high school, and some of the others would laugh at him, call him Ferdy the Birdie. They knew it bothered him, but they did it anyway. How is it possible, he wondered then, he still did now, for people deliberately to hurt someone else who hadn't hurt them? How is it possible? He worried over other things, all the time. The communists. He shook his head over the newspaper. Oscar offered an advice about the communists in two short words. Or it might be capital punishment. Oh, what a terrible thing if an innocent man was to be executed, Ferd moaned. Oscar said that was the guy's tough luck. Hand me that tire iron, Oscar said. And Ferd worried even about other people's minor concerns, like the time the couple came in with the tandem and the baby basket on it. Free air was all they took. Then the woman decided to change the diaper, and one of the safety pins broke. Why are there never any safety pins, the woman fretted, rummaging here and rummaging there. There are never any safety pins. Ferd made sympathetic noises, went to see if he had any. But though he was sure there'd been some in the office, he couldn't find them. So they drove off with one side of the diaper tied in a clumsy knot. At lunch, Ferd said it was too bad about the safety pins. Oscar dug his teeth into a sandwich, tugged, tore, chewed, swallowed. Ferd liked to experiment with sandwich spreads. The one he liked most was cream cheese, olives, anchovy, and avocado, mashed up with a little mayonnaise but Oscar always had the same pink luncheon meat. It must be difficult with a baby, Ferd nibbled. Not just traveling, but raising it. Oscar said, geez, there's drugstores in every block, and if you can't read, you can at least recognize them. Drugstores? Oh, to buy safety pins, you mean? Yeah, safety pins. But, you know, it's true. There's never any safety pins when you look. Oscar uncapped his beer, rinsed the first mouthful around. Aha! Always plenty of clothes hangers, though. Throw them out every month, next month, same closets full of them again. Now, what you want to do in your spare time, you invent the device which it'll make safety pins out of clothes hangers. Ferd nodded abstractly. But in my spare time, I'm working on the French racer. It was a beautiful machine, light, low-slung, swift, red and shining. You felt like a bird when you rode it. But good as it was, Ferd knew he could make it better. He showed it to everybody who came in the place, until his interest slackened. 
Nature was his latest hobby, or rather, reading about nature. Some kids had wandered by from the park one day with tin cans in which they had put salamanders and toads, and they proudly showed them to Ferd. After that, the work on the Red Racer slowed down, and he spent his spare time on natural history books. Mimicry, he cried to Oscar. A wonderful thing. Oscar looked up interestedly from the bowling scores in the paper. I seen Edie Adams on TV the other night, doing her imitation of Marilyn Monroe. Boy, oh boy. Ferd was irritated, shook his head. Not that kind of mimicry. I mean how insects and arachnids will mimic the shapes of leaves and twigs and so on to escape being eaten by birds or other insects and arachnids. A scowl of disbelief passed over Oscar's heavy face. You mean they change their shapes? What are you giving me? Oh, it's true. Sometimes the mimicry is for aggressive purposes, though, like a South African turtle that looks like a rock, and so the fish swim up to it and then it catches them. Or that spider in Sumatra. When it lies on its back, it looks like a bird dropping. Catches butterflies that way. Oscar laughed, a disgusted and incredulous noise. It died away as he turned back to the bowling scores. One hand groped at his pocket, came away, scratched absently at the orange thicket under the shirt, then went patting his hip pocket. Where's that pencil, he muttered, got up, stomped into the office, pulled open drawers. His loud cry of, hey, brought Ferd into the tiny room. What's the matter, Ferd asked. Oscar pointed to a drawer. Remember that time you claimed there were no safety pins here? Look, whole goddamn drawer is full of them. Ferd stared, scratched his head, said feebly that he was certain he'd looked there before. A contralto voice from outside asked, Anybody here? Oscar at once forgot the desk and its contents, called, Be right with ya, and was gone. Ferd followed him slowly. There was a young woman in the shop, a rather massively built young woman, with muscular calves and a deep chest. She was pointing out the seat of her bicycle to Oscar, who was saying, "Uh Uh-huh, and looking more at her than at anything else. It's just a little too far forward. Uh Uh-huh. As you can see, a wrench is all I need. Uh Uh-huh. It was silly of me to forget my tools. Oscar repeated, "Uh uh-huh, automatically, then snapped to. Fix it in a jiffy, he said. And despite her insistence that she could do it herself, he did fix it though not quite in a jiffy. He refused money. He prolonged the conversation as long as he could. Well, thank you, the young woman said. And now I've got to go. The machine feel all right to you now? Perfectly, thanks. Tell you what, I'll just ride along with you a little bit, just... Pear-shaped notes of laughter lifted the young woman's bosom. Oh, you couldn't keep up with me. My machine is a racer. The moment he saw Oscar's eye flit to the corner, Ferd knew what he had in mind. He stepped forward. His cry of, No! was drowned out by his partner's loud, Well, I guess this racer here can keep up with yours. The young woman giggled richly, said, Well, they would see about that, and was off. Oscar, ignoring Ferd's outstretched hand, jumped on the French bike and was gone. Ferd stood in the doorway watching the two figures hunched over their handlebars, vanish down the road into the park. He went slowly back inside. It was almost evening before Oscar returned, sweaty but smiling, smiling broadly. Hey, what a babe, he cried. He wagged his head, he whistled. He made gestures, noises like escaping steam. Boy, oh boy, what an afternoon. Give me the bike, Ferd demanded. Oscar said, yeah, sure, turned it over to him, and went to wash. Ferd looked at the machine. The red enamel was covered with dust. There was mud spattered, and dirt, and bits of dried grass. It seemed soiled, degraded. He had felt like a swift bird when he rode it. Oscar came out, wet and beaming. He gave a cry of dismay, ran over. Stand away, said Ferd, gesturing with the knife. He slashed the tires, the seat and seat cover, again and again. You crazy? Oscar yelled. You out of your mind? Ferd, no, don't, Ferd. 
Fur it cut the spokes, bent them, twisted them. He took the heaviest hammer and pounded the frame into shapelessness, and then he kept on pounding till his breath was gasping. You're not only crazy, Oscar said bitterly. You're rotten jealous. You can go to hell. He stomped away. Ferd, feeling sick and stiff, locked up, went slowly home. He had no taste for reading, turned out the light and fell into bed, where he lay awake for hours, listening to the rustling noises of the night and thinking hot, twisted thoughts. They didn't speak to each other for days after that, except for the necessities of the work. The wreckage of the French racer lay behind the shop. For about two weeks, neither wanted to go out back where he'd have to see it. One morning, Ferd arrived to be greeted by his partner, who began to shake his head in astonishment even before he started speaking. How did you do it? How did you do it, Ferd? Jeez, what a beautiful job. I gotta hand it to you. No more hard feelings, huh, Ferd? Ferd took his hand. Sure, sure, but what are you talking about? Oscar led him out back. There was the red racer, all in one piece, not a mark or scratch on it, its enamel bright as ever. Ferd gaped. He squatted down and examined it. It was his machine. Every change, every improvement he had made was there. He straightened up slowly. Regeneration. Huh? What say? Oscar asked. Then, hey, kiddo, you're all white. What do you do? Stay up all night and didn't get no sleep? Come on in and sit down. But I still don't see how you done it. Inside, Ferd sat down. He wet his lips. He said, Oscar, listen. Yeah? Oscar, you know what regeneration is? No? Listen. Some kinds of lizards. You grab them by the tail, the tail breaks off, and they grow a new one. If a lobster loses a claw, it regenerates another one. Some kinds of worms and hydras and starfish. You cut them into pieces. Each piece will grow back the missing parts. Salamanders can regenerate lost hands, and frogs can grow legs back. No kidding, Ferd. But, uh, I mean, nature, very interesting. But to get back to the bike now, how'd you manage to fix it so good? I never touched it. It regenerated, like a newt or a lobster. Oscar considered this. He lowered his head, looked up at Ferd from under his eyebrows. Well, now, Ferd, look, how come all broke bikes don't do that? This isn't an ordinary bike. I mean, it isn't a real bike. Catching Oscar's look, he shouted, Well, it's true! The shout changed Oscar's attitude from bafflement to incredulity. He got up. So, for the sake of argument, let's say all that stuff about the bugs and the eels or whatever the hell you were talking about is true. But they're alive. A bike ain't. He looked down triumphantly. Ferd shook his leg from side to side, looked at it. A crystal isn't either, but a broken crystal can regenerate itself if the conditions are right. Oscar, go see if the safety pins are still in the desk. Please, Oscar. He listened as Oscar, muttering, pulled the desk drawers out, rummaged in them, slammed them shut, tramped back. Nah, he said, all gone. Like that lady said that time, and you said, there never are any safety pins when you want them. They disappear. Ferd, what a... Ferd jerked open the closet door, jumped back as a shoal of clothes hangers clattered out. And like you say, Ferd said with a twist of his mouth, on the other hand, there are always plenty of clothes hangers. There weren't any here before. Oscar shrugged. I don't see what you're getting at. But anybody could have got in here and took the pins and left the hangers. I could have, but I didn't. Or you could have. Maybe, he narrowed his eyes, maybe you walked in your sleep and done it. You better see a doctor. Jeez, you look rotten. Ferd went back and sat down, put his head in his hands. I feel rotten. I'm scared, Oscar. Scared of what? He breathed noisily. I'll tell you. Like I explained before, about how things that live in the wild places, they mimic other things there. Twigs, leaves. 
toads that look like rocks. Well, suppose there are things that live in people places, cities, houses. These things could imitate, well, other kinds of things you find in people places. People places, for Christ's sake. Maybe they're a different kind of life form. Maybe they get their nourishment out of the elements in the air. You know what safety pins are, these other kinds of them? Oscar, the safety pins are the pupa forms, and then they, like, hatch into the larval forms, which look just like coat hangers. They feel like them even, but they're not. Oscar, they're not. Not really. Not really. Not... He began to cry into his hands. Oscar looked at him. He shook his head. After a minute, Ferd controlled himself somewhat. He snuffled. All these bicycles the cops find, and they hold them waiting for owners to show up. And, and then we buy them at the sale because no owners show up because there aren't any. And the same with the ones the kids are always trying to sell us. And they say they just found them. And they really did because they were never made in a factory. They grew. They grow. You smash them and throw them away. They regenerate. Oscar turned to someone who wasn't there and waggled his head. Ooh, boy, he said. Then to Ferd, you mean one day there's a safety pin and the next day instead there's a coat hanger? Ferd said, one day there's a cocoon, the next day there's a moth. One day there's an egg, the next day there's a chicken. But with... These, it doesn't happen in the open daytime where you can see it. But at night, Oscar, at night you can hear it happening. All the little noises in the nighttime, Oscar. Oscar said, then how come we ain't up to our belly button in bikes? If I had a bike for every coat hanger. But Hurd had considered that too. If every codfish egg, he explained, or every oyster spawn grew to maturity, a man could walk across the ocean on the backs of all the codfish or oysters there'd be. So many died, so many were eaten by predatory creatures, that nature had to produce a maximum in order to allow a minimum to arrive at maturity. And Oscar's question was, then who um, eats the uh, coat hangers? Ferd's eyes focused through wall, buildings, park, more buildings, to the horizon. You got to get the picture. I'm not talking about real pins or hangers. I got a name for the others. False friends, I call them. In high school French, we had to watch out for French words that looked like English words, but really were different. Faux amis, they call them. False friends. Pseudo pins. Pseudo hangers. Who eats them? I don't know for sure. Pseudo vacuum cleaners, maybe. His partner, with a loud groan, slapped his hands against his thighs. He said, Ferd, Ferd, for Christ's sake. You know what's the trouble with you. You talk about oysters, but you forgot what they're good for. You forgot there's two kinds of people in the world. Close up them books, them bug books and French books. Get out, mingle, meet people, soak up some brew. You know what? The next time Norma, that's this broad's name with the racing bike, the next time she comes here, you take the red racer, and you go out in the woods with her. I don't mind, and I don't think she will either. Not too much. But Ferd said no. I never want to touch the red racer again. I'm afraid of it. At this, Oscar pulled him to his feet, dragged him protestingly out to the back, and forced him to get on the French machine. Only way to conquer your fear of it. Ferd started off, white-faced, wobbling and in a moment was on the ground, rolling and thrashing, screaming. Oscar pulled him away from the machine. It threw me, Ferd yelled. It tried to kill me. Look, blood. His partner said it was a bump that threw him. It was his own fear. The blood? A broken spoke grazed his cheek, and he insisted Ferd get on the bicycle again to conquer his fear. But Ferd had grown hysterical. He shouted that no man was safe, that mankind had to be warned. It took Oscar a long time to pacify him and to get him to go home and into bed.
He didn't tell all this to Mr. Watney, of course. He merely said that his partner had gotten fed up with the bicycle business. It don't pay the worry and try to change the world, he pointed out. I always say take things the way they are. If you can't lick them, join them. Mr. Watney said that was his philosophy exactly. He asked how things were since. Well, not too bad. I'm engaged, you know. Name's Norma. Crazy about bicycles. Everything considered, things aren't bad at all. More work, yes, but I can do things all my own way, so... Mr. Watney nodded. He glanced around the shop. I see they're still making drop-frame bikes, he said. Though with so many women wearing slacks, I wonder they bother. Oscar said, well, I don't know. I kind of like it that way. Ever stop to think the bicycles are like people? I mean, of all the machines in the world, only bikes come male and female. Mr. Watney gave a little giggle, said that was right. He had never thought of it like that before. Then Oscar asked if Mr. Watney had anything in particular in mind, not that he wasn't always welcome. Well, I wanted to look over what you've got. My boy's birthday is coming up. Oscar nodded sagely. Now here's a job, he said, which you can't get in any other place but here. Specialty of the house. Combines the best features of the French racer and the American standard, but it's made right here, and it comes in three models. Junior, intermediate, and regular. Beautiful, ain't it? Mr. Watney observed that, say, that might be just the ticket. By the way, he asked, what's become of the French racer? Uh, the red one used to be here. Oscar's face twitched. Then it grew bland and innocent, and he leaned over and nudged his customer. Oh, that one. Old Frenchy. <laughs> Why, I put him out to stud. And they laughed, and they laughed. And after they told a few more stories, they concluded the sale, and they had a few beers, and they laughed some more. And then they said what a shame it was about Ferd, poor old Ferd, who had been found in his own closet with an unraveled coat hanger coiled tightly around his neck. All right, what did you think? So, obviously, it's a great story. It's the most influential story he ever wrote and was not given credit for. Uh, everybody's stolen it. Um, I remember when I was, you know, an adult, I, I just occasionally would read a comic book, and I read this horror comic that was totally that plot, and I showed it, I brought it and showed it to him when I visited, and he said, um, yeah, I guess it's become part of the, of the uh, collective unconscious now. Unfortunately, the collective unconscious doesn't pay very well. But um, I remember there was a, a, a newspaper columnist in San Francisco that I used to read named John Carroll. And yep. he wrote this column where he said, there's this idea in my brain. I'm just not sure where it came from. It's got to do with... Um, a creature that turns from safety pin to coat hanger to bicycle. And I read it and I got back to him. That's my father, Avram Davidson. And I sent a copy. No, I didn't write to him. I, I actually mailed the article to uh, Avram. And okay. then he responded to John Carroll. And then John Carroll wrote a, a, another column called, and the answer is Avram Davidson. <laughs> so, Clearly that story got into a lot of people's minds without most of them knowing where it came from. <laughs> Characters. So, you know, I, I came up and there may be a hundred different theories, but I came up with three possible theories. Yeah. Either one, uh, I mean, it's obviously a fictional story, but it's a true story. Right. Uh, that, that these things are actually happening. Right. Uh, two, that Ferd is making all these things, taking the, the safety pins and putting them back and fixing the bike and slashing the bike. Yeah. Or, or, or C, that Oscar is totally evil and he actually ended up killing Ferd, which I don't think is the case. But, but what, what's your thought? Let me give you my take. Okay. I don't think he was crazy. That's, that's like it, it, they woke up and it was a dream. That's too easy. Okay. <laughs> um, I think that it really happened. And I think that Oscar was in on it. He was like farming these creatures somehow. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that, that's what I got out of it. I thought maybe 
that he figured it out after. Yeah, so he figures, maybe. Because the line, the line that I didn't get until this last couple of times that I read it, which is he put the Frenchie out to stud. Exactly. So and now he's like farming these creatures. Exactly. And so, but the first time I read it, you know, for whatever reason, I kept thinking I put the Frenchie out to pasture, meaning he got rid of it. For whatever reason, it didn't. Stud. It, he I put it out to stud. And now you've got these Frenchie and American bikes. Right. And you've got all these choices that can only be found here. Oh, yeah. And so I'm thinking like those are the babies of the Frenchie and whatever other bikes he's found. I think they're the babies, now that you, you put that idea, of the woman's bike, which was a creature. And Except his... it was an Eng English bike. I, that, I thought about that, but I think she rode, I think she rode an English bike. Oh. Well, no, the, between that bike and the Frenchie, it could be. I was thinking about that too, except he mentioned that it's a Frenchie and American bike only found. I need to go back and look at that, Never. but it could be. Um, all right. What, one of the things I love to do with Auburn stories uh, is think about who, and it could be an old actor, new actor, but who would play the part? If you, if you put this on the big screen, you know, whether it was Netflix or something, uh, Black Mirror type episode, who would play the characters? You know, so there's Norma, Oscar, Ferd, and Mr. Watney. Do you have any, yeah. any thoughts on that? Well, the thing is, I only remember mostly celebrities from the 60s, 70s, that's, 80s. That's fine. But so they would all be old, but I don't really, that wouldn't fit. The characters aren't really supposed to be elderly. So uh. <laughs> it could think of it at that time. Who would you have put in it at that time, maybe? I mean, Dustin Hoffman will, can play anything. But who would he play? Uh, probably the guy who gets strangled and stuff. <laughs> okay. And then maybe Al Pacino could play uh, the other guy. That's good. And I like then, that. Um, the woman could be played, well, Meryl Streep can play anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. Um, so mine, mine probably a little more current, uh, you know, thinking, Megan Fox could be the could be the cyclist. Mm -hmm. uh, Will Ferrell, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, do you know who that is? No. Uh, comedian. Uh, I think he's kind of big guy. Could play Oscar. I mean, I think sort of know who he is, but okay. Super and then and then maybe Elijah Woods for Ferd. He played yeah. uh, Fro Frodo. He played Frodo in uh, in the Token movies. Oh, okay. And, sure. and then. Uh, Paul, uh, Paul Giamatti, you know who Paul Giamatti yeah. is? He's the guy who went on Colbert and was talking about Avram, who gave- Oh, yeah. I think, so he gets a part in every, he gets a part in every story. Sure. <laughs> if, we, if we can find a part, he gets it. So he'd play Mr. Watney. Okay. Yeah. Well, as always, uh, it is a pleasure seeing you and I, you know, I can't wait to keep this going. So, so the treasury is gonna be coming out first. Uh, actually, first is going to be, um, what is it, Boss on the Wall. That's going to be coming out really soon. Okay. In, in probably a couple of weeks. Uh, that I listened to it already. It's really good. That was done by Stefan Rudnicki. And then uh, a couple of mom's books are coming out real soon, including Dr. Grass, which was a, a, a bit racy. Uh, you could say. I, I think a lot of Grania's work was a bit racy. <laughs> and then uh, the treasury, and then followed up by uh, the other 19th century, which I've got a couple of amazing readers for that. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, thanks, Ethan, and uh, I'll look forward to talking to you soon. Yeah, for sure.